Uh, the doctor said it would be like this. How do you feel, old man? I'll prove you're not completely useless. It's nothing. Barely a flesh wound. Yeah, you were scared, weren't you, Goldie? I'm gonna find them. Uh, give them a hard goodbye. Oh! Oh, I see what you're doing here. It's parody, black comedy and whatnot. You're taking the whimsical and madcap world of Animaniacs and projecting Frank Miller's dark and gritty opus Sin City on top of it, combining for comedic effect. I like this. This is something they might have done on the show. And don't tell me they wouldn't. I've seen the fingerprints gag. I want you to know I'm laughing. On the inside. My soul is doing cartwheels. Even though I don't understand, I'm not sure what the point is. I'm flummoxed. Why would you do this? I don't know, but I'm intrigued. I'm forced to watch the rest of the video, and that's key. This is very good. I mean it. I want you to keep this up. And hard cut too. I cannot overstate how much I love Animaniacs. The animation was superb, the writing was fresh and witty, and in no way condescending to the target audience, which, as you all know at the time, garnered it a huge following of both kids and adults. And since it was a kind of variety show, it did introduce us to a lot of memorable characters, but not all of them. Because before Animaniacs, there was Tiny Toons, which had a lot of similarities, but has not aged nearly as well. Michelle Pfeiffer, Mel Gibson, dumb nuts. In comparison, I like how the joke name's career has probably held up the best. Now, Mel, I didn't say you couldn't make a movie where you beat Jesus up for two hours. I just said you shouldn't. That's because both of them had a lot of the same subject, but handled it in different ways. While Animaniacs were original creations based off the archetypes of cartoons that came before it, Tiny Toons, for the most part, was viewed as another one of those classic characters reincarnated as kids shows. Pathetic, isn't it? Mindless clones following the crowd because they think it's hip and trendy. I don't do things just because everyone thinks it's cool. I'm an individual. <laughs> See what you did there. That's not to say it wasn't one of the best ones, but it was obvious that the series restricted itself to certain tropes. School, dating, jobs, trying to be all hip and remind you that it's the 90s every five seconds. I have no idea what that meant. Unexpectedly, the most original characters in the series turned out to be the female characters. Babs, who was far more capable than Buster, wasn't quite a clone of Bugs in that she was more manic and fancied herself as an impressionist. Shirley has since become an interesting artifact of the Valley Girl and Crystal Groupie movement. Like, welcome to Hawaii! Enjoy these ultra-rare flowers that, like, die for you, you murderers! Elmira remains an inspired twist on the whole hunting animals motif. And Fifi? Well, she was voiced by Cat Sose. However, for the most part, the important characters were just many versions of Warner Brothers classics. I bring it up because I find it interesting that they couldn't make the girls clones of the boys, since they were already clones of the adults. I guess it's true. Necessity is the mother of getting your fingers out of your nose and doing your job. You guys the pizza people? Naturally, there are exceptions, like Sweetie being a total Tweety clone, and Foulmouth being a truly unexpected curveball on Foghorn Leghorn's speech impediment. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is because if you don't count every little exception to the rule, that apparently counts as a wrong against me. So you happy now, you little- But that isn't to say Animaniacs didn't take a lot of the same humor from the show. Heck, if Tiny Toons wasn't already a precursor to that show already, we are actually introduced to the prototype Warner Brothers in the episode Two Toad Town. Why, you two tones are better than Tiny Toons. Better than Tiny Toons? Nah. Plus, there are episodes actually entitled Animaniacs and What's Up Nurse. 
just slightly off on that one. Also kiped from T.T. was the relentless parodies and lampooning of the Hollywood studio environment, which became the backbone and backdrop of Animaniacs. You see, every once in a while, the Acme Acres gang, usually plucky, wanted to make a movie or TV show or meet some celebrity, so they usually ended up outside the Warner Brothers studio, where they tended to run into a familiar face. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! Hold it! Where do you think you're going? Hello, I'm Plucky Duck. I'm Hampton. Do you have a pass? <laughs> I certainly mundo. Acme University Hall Pass? Our alma mater. Well, why didn't you say so? <laughs> I love this job! Oh, give it about three years, and then see if it gets to you. Now a lot of you have recognized Ralph from Animaniacs as the studio guard who, alongside Dr. Scratch and Sniff and Hello Nurse, is responsible for keeping the Warner Brothers, and Warner's sister, in check. But a lot of people forget that he actually made his debut on Tiny Toons, giving Plucky here a hard time. I'm Edward Hedgecopper Hands, an old friend of you, Mr. Burton's. Your was that a quip? That was a quip. And in the form of a pun, too. Way to go, Ralph. Wait a second. Listen, you look like a sporting guy. How's about we settle this with a little wager? A game of scissors, paper, rock? I win, I go in. You win, I calmly walk away. Ah, okay. Scissors, paper, rock. Nasty. By the way, I realize I'm switching between varying qualities of footage here, but the only way I can get this episode is on a Nickelodeon rerun transfer. Since for some reason, Warner Brothers stopped releasing episodes of Tiny Toons or Animaniacs. What the hell's wrong with you? I bought the DVD set. I have money. I want to give it to you. So unlike Animaniacs, not only does Ralph have the upper hand in this situation, but he's actually clever about it. This all works with Plucky because, like his forefather, he is a pompous, self-serving jerk and doomed to fail at all things for our amusement. Mother! True story. Frank Welker, who voiced Ralph here, is not only an industry legend renowned for his abilities, but he's also an avid golf enthusiast. In fact, animators actually studied his swing for this animation. However, seeking the perfection he puts into every vocal performance, Welker insisted that the motion capture session not end until he was satisfied. Two intense hours later, when they tried to tell him that they had enough to work with, he became belligerent and violent, lashing out while brandishing a five iron. Of course, this is no surprise in retrospect, since it was known that Welker spent most of his time back then coked up and high on PCP. And if any of that story is untrue, then Mr. Welker is free to rebuttal these claims by appearing on the public forum of his choosing. Might I suggest Talking Tunes with Rob Paulson, the weekly podcast featuring the who's who amongst voice acting talent, now available on iTunes and, as always, techjives.net. You know. Just a thought. But getting back to the subject, what makes Ralph special is not only does he knock around Plucky, but in a later episode, Buster and Babs Go Hawaiian, he gives the carrot-munching couple the business, too. We're here to see Steven Spielberg. Yeah, your name ain't on the list. Now there's a very consistent formula for cartoons that's been around since the 1930s. And that is, the smaller the character is, the better position they're in. But even if our headliners for the series are bested, it shouldn't be by a lumbering man-mass who sounds like he's a weakened crayon-melting enthusiast. I must have never seen a cartoon in his life. Now this episode is famous among certain circles for actually being written by a trio of 8th graders. 
I have no idea how this script got through the studio, but if it's true, then this is really impressive. Now, I can't tell if these girls were a set of revolutionary thinkers that wanted to buff the old conventions of Warner Brothers animation, or if they just saw Ralph beating up Plucky in an earlier episode and thought it would be funny to reenact it. The more I think about it, the more it just messes with my head. First of all, I kind of want to see more of Ralph as the wise guy security guard. But I'm not supposed to because I should be rooting for the main characters. Then a few years later I see him again, but this time he's completely helpless and dumber than a flock of bricks. I gotcha! Uh, not. That, that's just a little disjointing. It's like watching Duck Amuck and then watching Rabbit Rampage which is pretty much the same formula, except it's Bugs instead of Daffy, and at the end it's Elmer as the animator. Isn't it weird seeing Bugs in that position after years of outwitting every opponent? I had only known Ralph for a total of no more than three minutes of screen time, but I eventually went through the same reaction after years of watching both shows multiple times. You know, while I was trying to figure out how the hell Ralph caught the Warner Brothers in 1930, but he's not an old man by the time they escape in 1993. I've been alive for four and a half centuries, and I am immortal. And you know what? If you really think about it, Animaniacs is kind of a spin-off or sister series to Tiny Toons, connected by this one character that pulls double duty. At first I chose the Sin City motif as just a joke, but then I started to think about colors in the way that the comic does, and an interesting relationship appeared. For those who don't know, Frank Miller's Sin City is a black and white nor comic, save for certain splashes of colors, possibly to signify deeper meanings about the character or object. It's open to a lot of interpretation, and it's different for both the comic and the movie, but I personally like this theory. Red represents power, blue means corruption, Green equals envy, and yellow means danger. The Warner Brothers' noses are red because they are powerful. They can do anything they want. The badge on Ralph's hat is yellow because he is dangerous. Everyone tries to avoid him. Even to the Animaniacs, he's a danger, at least to their fun. Now, Ralph has no red in his normal color model, but he does have a blue uniform, which I have chosen not to show here, because Ralph is not corrupt. Despite his method of dealing with trespassers, in reality, he's just a nice guy trying to do his job so he can support his ugly as sin family. He's not chasing the Warner Brothers for food or personal gain. He does it because he has to. In fact, as long as they stay on the lot and don't bother anybody, his relationship with the Warner Brothers is pretty casual. And in turn, if you really watch those chase segments, the Warners don't do anything malicious to make Ralph hurt himself. He just can't do what they do as well as them. It's a game of follow the leader, where the guy in last place is constantly tripping over himself. Plucky is green, because he's always envious of what someone else has. Where's my money? Money, attention, and glory! Right now, right here, right in the old feathered palm. But his bill isn't yellow like it usually is, because he's not dangerous except to himself. There, I just explained the relationships of the characters from the chess station to full realization of the Warner Brothers animation renaissance through symbolic imagery and illusion. But in conclusion, I find Ralph interesting because he's portrayed very differently between the two different shows. And to be honest, I like the Tiny Toons version more. It's not every day that the big, dumb-sounding guy is secretly the clever wisecracker. But in a type of bittersweet poetry, the more revolutionary show is the one that kind of turned him into a by-the-numbers cartoon pursuer. I would have really loved to have seen a couple Ralph cartoons where he just dealt with stuff that didn't involve the Warner Brothers. And that would be interesting! Security guards are great for comedy! The best Porky cartoon ever featured a security guard. Peter Griffin's voice was based off a New England security guard. Paul Bart was a thing. That existed. And with a job like that, Ralph would run into all sorts of interesting characters, which you've actually shown on the series. Uh, I'm sorry, sir, but this is a black tie affair.
and you couldn't do anything with that? Maybe you should have given him a shot before Pinky Elmira in the Brain. Now talk about confusing. That's a crossover between a spin-off of a side series that circles back in on its own prototype. Let's see, where to begin? Ah yes, Uranus is gaseous. <sighs> Naughty mousy big head! Mustn't uh, use naughty uh, naughty uh, dirty words! <laughs> Bye, have a beautiful time.